I don't know about most guys, but a lot of young guys, their culinary skills are exhausted by, you know, boiling up some pasta and like dumping a jar of sauce onto it or some ramen noodles Mm. or something like that. And that's just, it's pathetic. I'm sorry to say, like, you know, fast forward a little bit into the middle ages, you go to the middle ages and the culinary arts uh, kind of fall down quite a bit actually uh there are still cooks that are cooking for kings and queens but the food is it's uh not nearly as sophisticated as it was in rome it's only like a it's it's only like a couple steps above the common folk it's just there's a lot of it you know what i mean and this is when they start to import spices from the east and they get really big into that right um so you're looking at things like, you know, they, they had your roast pork and they had you know, different vegetables and stuff like that. Breads. This is when when the, the nobility actually started to eat bread, like bread became a thing that they would eat. I mean, it's not as not as much as we eat it today, but it, compared to like the, the ancient Rome in ancient Rome, the noble class even touch bread. That was like, no, that's for poor people. We don't eat bread. Right. They would eat pulse, which is made from 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 gluten, but they would not touch bread. Bread is like, no, that's no go. But the people in Rome lo- in lo- loved bread and they had they had a actually very sophisticated um, way of baking bread. They had a lot of really good recipes. They were very talented uh, bakers back then. And this tradition carried through into the Middle Ages when uh, cookeries or bakeries began to be uh ran by guilds right we had the guild system back in the middle ages and the guilds were they would oversee they would make sure the prices were right they would make sure that there was cleanliness they would make sure people got paid right etc they were like unions right for you guys that aren't familiar with the guild system so they would run these these bakeries and um and originally and then eventually the bakeries one bakery in france uh there was a baker that started to sell soup and he called these soups restoratives and this is where we get our word restaurant so uh eventually bakeries started to sell soups they started to sell bread with meat and cheese and stuff baked into it they started to develop more culinary tradition and not just you know uh, bread that that the the peasants would take home and eat with their with their food and to be clear the medieval diet even for peasants was not that bad. It was actually pretty good. If you went back in time back then, at least during times of plenty and you're not during a plague or a great war or something like that. If you went back in time to hang out with, let's say like the lower middle class of the middle ages, you would be like, wow, you guys are eating pretty good. They had access to fresh sham as fresh salmon. They had fresh produce. They ate uh, mushy peas. Uh, their porridge was very, uh, their porridge and their bread was much more uh, nutritious than what we have today. You know, they ate a lot of oats and they had fresh fruit and they had beer that they brewed themselves. They ate and drank pretty good. They, you know I mean, their, their diet was more nutritious than ours is today. Right. Your, your medieval peasant ate better than your middle class. That's a pretty fucking low bar though. <laughs> Let's be <Yeah>. honest. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's something that, that, that I like, I point out every time it gets brought up is we, we watch movies, we hear what the academics say, the progressives, they have this idea that everything in the past was filthy and disgusting and worse. The bottom line is that medieval people had straighter spines. They had wider jaws. They had better eyesight and they had more nutritious meals with, with, uh, fish from plentiful uh, uh, waters that were not overfished yet. They had access to fresh produce and stuff like that. They they ate and drank good. These were healthy people, and we know that because when we dig them up, they don't have their like. I guess you know a lot of some of them will have some problems, but on average, they have better better teeth than we do. They had better. Uh, they had less problems than us, you know. A lot of also, that. Also, also yeah. helpfully, they they had a more eugenic environment. So they did. That, they did. That certainly helps too. Anyway, so going forward, fast forward to uh, the, the next big marker in the in the t- timeline of culinary arts, in in my view, is coming in around uh, like the Napoleonic Wars. Right, they were talking seventeen late seventeen hundreds, and um, there was a fella named. Uh, Marie Antoine uh, Car- uh, Caramay, right? He was a French guy. The French 
were huge. Culinary was huge in France. And this was this was the time where um, especially under King Louis the Fourteenth, King Louis the Fourteenth was obsessed with the culinary arts. He was obsessed with this kind of stuff. He's the guy. He actually he got rid of this medieval. He called it medieval gluttony, and he he decided to start serving him and his his uh, his court in in courses to not waste food because he felt that that was gluttonous and and rotten, right? And then he he uh, also uh, introduced this idea of let's not use foreign spices and all this foreign ingredients let's grow it here i want fresh is what he said so they started growing their own leeks their own onions they started this is where the artichokes come into the game this is when uh and this bled over into other countries as well this is the italians were like hey maybe tomatoes aren't aren't poisonous you know this is like this is this was a big boom and it was it was uh guided and influenced and informed by the noble classes by the the royal by the royalty and um this obviously bled into the other uh the other classes as well restaurants started started to started uh, trying to emulate that and trying to give people uh food like this so uh this guy marie antoine Car- carame he cooked for uh czar alexander the first he cooked for napoleon he cooked for um all kind of people man we're talking uh kings and queens and he was like the the first he was like the first uh, uh gordon ramsay or something like that you know what i mean he was the first but he was also a brilliant man invented a lot of stuff this is where we get our mother sauces or our leading sauces. This is this is one of the cores of culinary we, how we understand it today are the mother sauces. He invented a bunch of different recipes. And this guy was this guy was like the the Odinic force in in culinary. He came in, burned it down, re like created all of this crazy stuff, never really wrote anything down. He was just a man of passion and brilliance that kind of like threw it all out there. Look at, you know, uh, taste my food, taste it. And like, Oh my God, it blew everybody away. So there's a guy that came after him. That was sort of the Tyric force. And this is the guy that, that everybody like really, really, really remembers. And this is a guy, Auguste Escoffier. This guy is like this guy is probably more influential on our society and how we live than than most big names that you could name in history. You know, you talk about like Mozart or like somebody like names that everybody's familiar with. Uh, Auguste Escoffier has more influence on our everyday lives than than most people you can name from history. He's almost like the Edison of food. You know what I mean? Like there's a before and after him. And that's that's like the axial changeover you know what i mean he's a very very important dude big time big time so this guy escoffier was a french guy he uh he grew up in his uh, his uncle's kitchen which back in those times the the kitchen the restaurants were kind of filthy chaotic places they were places where you didn't want to work it was grueling it was long hours it was dirty it was just it was not fun to work in those environments so uh, uh, Escoffier got got drafted into the military, and he spent a few years as a milit as a as an army cook, and learned how to be a, a soldier. And when he came out, he used that experience to shape uh, how to cook, how to operate a kitchen. So this guy, uh, and he wrote a book too. I can't remember what the book's called, but the in in the book he outlines this is how we need to organized kitchens and instead of chaos and instead of uncleanliness and instead of grueling long hours he professionalized it and this is where you get the word chef this is where you get uh your sous chef and your saucier and your gaumanger and, and your your fry cook and you know you get all of these guys and you know you get you get uh, how we understand kitchens today you know if you watch shows where kitchens are you work in a high-end kitchen uh, yes chef heard chef no chef you know, you know, all of that stuff, you know, ready in five, blah, 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 you know, fries working, all, all that kind of shouting things out and organizing. And it's almost, very much like a military culture in a, in a way. It is a military culture. One hundred percent. The in fact, the 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 chef coat that you see is based off of the old French uh, military coat, like captain's mm. coat. And um, uh, like all of that is literally 
based on military culture. And that is where you get the discipline and the cleanliness and like the hardcore kind of it's almost like when when you are cooking on a line in a in a uh, uh, high end restaurant, you feel that you are at boot camp. It is like boot camp. Right. There is there's no break. It's go, go, go. It's high pressure. There's shouting and yelling and it's a, it's aggressive. It's a it's a man's environment. It really is. But um, yeah. Escoffier on top of that, on top of that, um, in comes the, the advent of the, the stove, the wood stove. They didn't have stoves before this, the fire stove. So now they can actually, they have burners. They have ways that they can bake stuff. The stove was a huge deal. And uh, Escoffier, he invented canning, like ways to preserve uh, food, like, you know, in jars, like jarring, canning. He invented, uh, he, he changed the way knives are shaped. So your, your chef knife that you use in your kitchen. That was from his Escoffier's uh, influence. This guy was hugely, he added another mother sauce. This guy changed the game. If you just go Google Escoffier inventions and you'll be blown away by the amount of stuff that this guy does, like this guy came up with that you use today. So fast forward a little bit. There's another restaurant that um, another uh, spot in history that I think is important to mention is um delmonico's uh delmonico steakhouse in manhattan this was a hugely influential um uh part because uh in the old world after the french revolution and all this all the 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 revolutions that happened in europe a bunch of kings and queens and shit got killed so you had all of these royal uh chefs and everything that didn't have anywhere to work so they just opened restaurants and they're like, fuck, I guess I'll just cook for these people then, right? So they they open these cookeries, these restaurants, right? Well, from that culture, we, uh, that didn't hit the, the diaspora. That didn't hit uh, America yet. Well, uh, Domonico's came, and Domonico's got set up in 18, um, uh, 1820 or something like that. And Domonico's originally started as two Italian brothers. They opened a, a, a cafe, a uh, uh, pastry shop and eventually it became a restaurant and it eventually blew up. This is before Manhattan was Manhattan. As you see it today, it was still pretty popping. It was still a pretty popping hub of, 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 uh, um, economic force, right? It was, this is a place you could go and, and, and do good business, but it wasn't like it is today. Like it, a, a regular guy back in these times could buy property in Manhattan. It wasn't, it wasn't inaccessible millions of dollars kind of place. Right. So they opened this, this restaurant called Delmonico's and um, they are just brilliant, right? They, they invent dishes like eggs Benedict. They invent dishes like chicken a la King. They invent the Delmonico steak, that cut of steak that we all like. They invented it. They invent a lot of stuff. And uh, in this, they start getting the who's who of America coming and eating at their place. You know, obviously like politicians and stuff, but also guys like Mark Twain and like uh, you know, just the, the famous folks of that time came and they, they took that back with them and spread that all throughout America. So this culinary tradition that started in Rome went to uh, guys like Carame and Escoffier and the French royalty, and then later uh, ended up in America and spread throughout, became how we do cuisine. Haute cuisine became the standard of how we cook, and it blended in. It's really special. It blended in with our regional foods and our regional ideas, too. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's quite an evolution. Actually, I was just looking and at that uh, Delmonico's place as you were – uh, mentioning it because uh, the name is very familiar. And then I, I just like Googled it. And if you look at the actual building that it's situated, it's a very famous building in New York. Like if, if you look out, if you just look at it, you'd be like, I have totally seen this before kind mm -hmm. of thing. Right. So yeah, it's definitely um, that's, that's an important landmark, especially in like, you know, American cuisine and uh, in, in, in the 19th century, it seems like the 19th century is kind of like, when modernity really was born in so many ways. I mean, this goes mm -hmm. far beyond what we're talking about today, but um, you kind of see things kind of becoming formalized in some ways, like especially with Escoffier, um, he kind of quantized cooking in a way 
that had not been done before. Uh, that that like this was totally new. It's it's kind of hard to like um, get across just how innovative he was. He turned like uh, cooking and the culinary arts into a science, right? So instead of having like a pinch of this. Or and you're just like winging it and shit in the kitchen. Yeah, we've got like one and a half teaspoons of this. Cook on high flame for this time with this technique and everything. It's very 19th century. This book that he wrote. I think it's it's called um, Guide Culinaire or something. It's just like a, gu- a culinary guide is what it means. Um, it's very 19th century. It turns everything into a science, and it, it's it's you know he's he's writing it all down. I actually thought that what you said there about yeah, he, him being the tyric force is a very apt description. Actually, um, he reduces everything to writing, where you can now basically it, like he formalizes everything to where you can now make the same dish. Uh, on successive nights or you know successive weeks and it comes out exactly the same Mm -hmm. and it's you no longer need the guild um that was you know so important to like the culinary tradition before this right as as you as dave mentioned um the guild was basically like a trade union but it was also uh the bearer of tradition so whether it is in you know smithing or tailoring or in masonry or in cooking in 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 chef work the guild was where you went to learn a trade um and so it's it's kind of like the um the trade union plus your training environment right uh and what this meant was basically that like generally things were not written down because in some cases they were like uh, they, they were trade secrets of course um what Escoffier did was he basically went around kind of like Grimm in some – the Brothers Grimm in the 19th century and wrote down all the shit that was kind of like floating around that he could find. And he, and he just put it into a, a massive guide. Like it, it was – this this guide was um, translated into English in the early like 1900s in a – very much abridged version and it comes out to 900 pages right mm. this is a massive massive undertaking that this guy did and i actually read through some of this book before the episode and it is like it, it like he goes into the fundamentals of cooking like it's almost the first like you know couple of chapters are almost philosophical in some ways you know mm. what i mean he, like he really starts from like the ground up in terms of, of of cooking and everything like that but importantly and you know this may sound kind of prosaic he writes everything down and this is important and this is something that i want to get across to guys because you know this episode is as much about um you know the, the history of the culinary arts and the importance of it but it's also an exhortation for you to get out there and like learn to cook you know i like it if if like one person picks up like a cookbook and starts to like learn how to make italian or like you know asian stir fry or something like that if one person gets that out of, out of this episode I'll, I'll, i will feel like we've done uh like it's been a success right but the, so so well it's an exhortation to to do this shit um and one of the things that i want to get across here for guys who are interested who want to start to learn how to cook Maybe the most important tip that I can give is kind of the the same thing, actually, that Marcus Follin says about going into the gym. He says, my most important piece of equipment when I go into the gym is my pocketbook, where I write down everything. I write, write down my reps. I write, write down the weight. I, I write down how I've you know progressed. And, and th- this is like without this, I basically am just flying blind. And it's the same thing with your recipes, right? You have to write everything down always. This is the essential feature of of science after all right like everything is noted down written down made public everyone you know can it's it's there for all to see if this is how you go and in general this is you know a life lesson you can apply this to many domains this is how you go from shitty to okay to great to fucking amazing right you've got to write things down you if, if you want to progress in anything um 
you have to have some sort of a record, right? Keep a set of files. This is what I do on my computer, right? Like I, I've, I've got I've a bunch of shit, actually. The, one of the prompts for me to uh, suggest this episode to Dave was that I have recently taken all of my, like I've got a little subfolder on my computer that's just got like tons of notepad files that are totally disorganized. And what I've done now, because I'm, I'm, the, I'm the chef in the family, I'm the one that cooks the dinners, uh, every week... I come up with, you know, however many dinners we need and I'm actually putting them into like formally into like word files now. And this is going to eventually become a book that I give to my kids. So this is important, right? Do that at least, at least like, you know, start keeping notes and stuff like that. This is, this is how you get better at anything. This is how you get better at cooking. So Escoffier is kind of a model for this, right? So he's important. It's, it's an important paradigm. So, yeah. He also invented the bouillon cube. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a, it's, like what didn't he invent, right? Like it's just, it's crazy. It's, it's I think he, he got attributed to, he, he recorded something like 10,000 recipes and like invented 5,000 or I can't, maybe those numbers are wrong, but it was like some astronomical number. But anyway, uh, what Mike was talking about, I'm going to be honest with you guys. If we meet in person and I know that you can't cook at all, that's like I, I feel some kind of way about that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I like, you know, there's guys who oh, post physique, post physique. I'm I'm like, you know, post what you could cook. If you can't cook, you know, you're like the kind of guy that like doesn't read books. You're like like you're like a little baby or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, it, it is it is kind of infantile, isn't it? Like you know, I'm 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 not trying to because like, there's probably a lot of guys that are listening that like you know don't really do that, but you know, I'm not trying to I, I, I'm not trying to make you feel shitty or whatever, but like it is kind of. <laughs> You're right. When you say it's like a little baby or whatever. And look, hey, again, I was there until only kind of recently, right? Mm-hmm. Like only within the last 10 years that I made a concerted effort to like learn how to actually do the shit, right? Um, and, and it's mostly been prompted by having a family. So I, I get you, right? Like we've all got like more important shit to do. We've got like other things to do. But this is actually important, and, and and it's more important than you think, right? And it will improve your quality of life quite a bit. And you know what? It it like women appreciate it too. <laughs> it, it's it's something that you know, of course, they find attractive, right? So it, it is a monster flex. If yeah. like you if you want to impress a girl and you bring her over and you cook her some high end shit, like you're in a restaurant and you serve wine. That is like a gigantic flex. You're like, you're showing I am a man of culture. You know, I mean, it's more important to be a man of culture than it is to be like, uh, you know, I think every man should be able to cook at high level. Every man should be able to dance a little bit. Every man should be able to like do some sort of recite poetry or sing or do so. You should be a man of culture. And um, cooking is like, you know, what, what is more important than cooking? You know what I mean? You, you eat three times a day, two times a day, however many times a day. Eating, you have to eat to survive. So why not uh, establish culture in your most frequent thing that you do? And it's an important question, right? Like what's for dinner? It, it really sort of like, you know, hits you at your lizard brain level, right? Like, you know, like when a, when a woman comes over to your apartment and and you can make a, a really nice meal. It's like she she's instinctually understands that you're a provider, right? Yeah, big time, big time. You're like, you know, uh, they say uh, there was like during the, I guess during like the 50s and, and stuff like that, they kind of created this meme that women cook. And, you know, we, we, there is a place for women in, in culinary. There, there's absolutely a place for women cooking. You know, there's a big family functions growing up. It, for me, it was always like the grand, grandmothers and great aunts got together and, you know, uh, cooked and, you know, fed everybody. Right. But when it when it comes to high end culinary uh, technique, the best chefs in history have all been men. Yeah, that is our thing. Right. If you want to focus in and make one really special high end dish, that's a man thing. And I'm gonna, and we're gonna get into. I'm gonna give you some g- examples of some dishes that you can do that are big flexes, that are not hard, that you can that you can nail. I'm gonna go in. We're gonna talk about a few of the things that you need to do if you're not a cook. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going into Chef Dave mode, so I'm sorry if I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, I will be there with you. I'll be your sous chef, man. We'll tag oh, team yeah. it. Well, we were definitely like part of the impetus for this episode is to give guys tips, right? And 
and also to exhort you and 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 to light a fire under your ass to like do this shit. But yeah, definitely, like I, I think that's valuable. So yeah, hell yeah. So uh, recently there was that that lady that went viral going after the seasoning police, right? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the seasoning police. And um, I'll tell you what, she's mostly right. She's mostly right when she's talking about these these people. When they say you're using these seasoning, what they mean is you're not using this this trash all spice. And you know that's it's full of MSGs. And you know what? I, I have. You're listening to an episode of the latest Culture Dads: Age of Sword and Cassette, where two fathers and community leaders discuss modern culture from a timeless perspective. Head on over to culturedads.com for podcasts every week. <laughs>